There are several, right? But the convergence tests apply to very, in very specific cases. What to, they specifically apply to types of series, right? So these are we're adding all these pieces up. Wh what can you tell me about this first one here? What what are the, what's the key thing? This is what, and what's the only thing you really need to know about an alternating series to know if it converges? Does it get smaller? As long as an alternating series descends, it closes in on zero. Will it converge? Yes. Yes. So in this one, does it? Do, is this alternating? Yes. Does it? As as it, does it go? Does each individual term does it go to zero? Yes. So we know that this one is going to converge. So we know one converges, right? So therefore, what can we automatically get rid of? B and C. So are we already ahead of the curve? Five seconds in, you're already ahead of the curve. You you've narrowed it down. Um, okay. What about this one right here? What do we do on two? What do we know about two? What should we focus on about this? Is this a ratio test? Okay, so how do you use the ratio test, James? Yep, and what ratio do you do? Yeah, that's fine. No, no, no. What, so you don't have to do the individual term, but what are you testing? So basically tell me, what does the ratio test? What do you have to do? The ratio of what? The ratio of like... Uh, between two terms. Which two terms? The first and the tenth? No, um, the, the consecutive term. N plus one term and the yeah. nth term. So you look at specifically what happens, the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus one over a n. That's what you're talking about, correct? Is that what you're saying it is? So yes, now what you were saying before, which is when you start doing this, what are you looking at? You're looking at, so you're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth plus 1 term, right? So that's going to be 1 over n plus 1 times 3 over 2 to the n plus 1, all, all over 1 over n, 3 over n to the, not 3 over 2. That's a very different experience um, like this. Is this what we're trying to evaluate? Yes. Now, you just need to be very careful about this, correct? So when you compress this out, you got to do some flipping, right? You end up with 1 over n plus 1 times n over 1, right? You have 3 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n over 3 to the n. We just, I've just reciproc reciprocated. Can you say that? Can you reciprocate it? You, when you take a reciprocal, reciprocated doesn't really work. Okay, I'm trying here. Okay, I'm trying. So when you do this, what happens though as n goes to infinity? What happens to this? One. That goes to 1, correct? Can we simplify a bunch of these other ones? Yeah, the n's go away here, right? Mm -hmm. The n's go away right here. And what do you end up with? Two. 3 over 2. So as you get really, really big, the terms are converging to what? Three. 3 over 2. Each individual, sorry, the ratio is con it's going to 3 over 2. So what does this tell us? It's getting bigger and bigger. bigger. What, to be more specific. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I understand. Go ahead. But this gets infinitely close to 1 because you have, this is totally inconsequential, right? So you effectively have n over n. As n gets huge, the single number 1 gets infinitely inconsequential and it gets infinitely close to 1 from the bottom. It's going to be 0 0.9999999999, which is 1. Then you have 3 over 2. So I guess let's rewind a second. When you end up with this number, 3 over 2, what, do you, what part of the ratio test do you need to know about? So we did this ratio, but what does the ratio test tell us that we need to check for? It tells us if it converges or diverges based on this number, if this number is what? Greater than The absolute value of that is greater than 1. Yes. Is th this right here is greater than 1. Therefore, what, what do we know? It's, uh, it diverges. So, ah, what what does it specifically tell? Do you remember? If it equals one, doesn't tell you anything. It's one of the frustrating things about the ratio test. You really want it to be less than one or greater than one. If it equals one, doesn't tell you anything conclusively. Nice, huh? I know, but I feel like diverges, right? So, can two be part of our answer? No, it diverges. So, which one can we cross out? E. So, we're getting better here. Oh, unfortunately, though, we haven't narrowed it down to one, so do we actually need to look at the third one here? I think we should look at the third one. First. <laughs> the third one what? Second. Well, again, we didn't. We don't have perfect vision here, but like, let's just do three now. What do we have to do for this one? What should we do? 
We know that the sum, like this, 1 over n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n, we know that that's the harmonic, right? And this is divergent, right? Yes. Okay, great. What do we know how, if x, for again, n is greater than 2 here, or greater than or equal to 2, how does n ln n compare to 1 over n? It's going to be what? It's going to be smaller, but we don't know by how much. And hold on, wait, hold on. Let's just do little pieces here. We know that as long as n is, we can we can pick one further. We could say n is. It's kind of arbitrary here because we can always cut out a finite number of terms, and it doesn't change the the behavior of the whole series. So we could say just for sake, because L, let's make it greater than or equal to three, right? Ln of three is going to be greater than one. Therefore, putting it in the denominator will make this thing smaller, right? So we now know that this right here is smaller than what? Smaller than a, yeah, hold on a sec. Smaller than, let's say, n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over uh, n, like that. We know it. So we know it's smaller than divergent. Does that tell us anything? No. Smaller than divergent doesn't tell us anything. So, so we'd love to find a convergent one that this is smaller than. Now, does anything come to mind, Matt? You, so at this point, I like this. This is still like, does this, we, we are still like this. We're not definitive. Let's be definitive. We want to integrate. I'd imagine you're trying to integrate 1 over n ln n yep. dn, yeah, from whatever, 2 to infinity, right? You're talking about this indefinite integral right here, right? So how do we integrate something like this? U substitution. What do you want u to be? U to be ln n. So what does du equal? 1 over n dn, right? So what does dn equal? n du. I just like doing that right now. I like doing it this way. You don't have to. I like this. I'm just showing you the nicest way that I do it again. So then you have this integral and it's going to be 1 over, what do we say? u is, you, uh, <laughs> I should not use n's and u's. I should not use n's and u's. Okay. Hold on a sec. You know what I'm going to do just so that I don't go crazy because I almost had a little bit of a panic attack right there. Ready? W is equal to ln n. DW is equal to 1 over n dn. So dn is equal to n dw. Is that okay? Yes. Are we okay with it? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so what do we have here? 1 over n w, right? And what is dn? n dw. Is it magical? This is the whole thing you're looking for, right? Because what cancels now? The ends. Is that a, the ends cancel. Is, do you really want that to happen? Yes. Yes, you do. Now, here's the key, though. Um, when we're doing this, I've left something off. I've avoided writing something that isn't true. What's our lower limit of integration become? Ln of two. Ln of two, right? And here's the thing. Can, can you write something like this? Yes. Not really. You can't, but it's still getting big, right? It's still going to infinity, right? So what do you, what's the proper way of writing this? You're doing, this is going to not, in, you're going to what? Let's say B, right? Ln of B, and you're doing the limit as what? B goes to infinity. That's the better way to write it, you know, just to be proper. It doesn't actually break it completely. I love the fact that we've got to a math where you can, you know, you get so used to people saying like, math is awesome because it's either right or wrong, right? Well, you can kind of break it a little bit and be a little lazy, especially since this is a multiple choice question. Can you be a little sloppy? Yes. If you had to write this out, be careful because they will look at it. So when you're doing this, you're specifically looking at the limit as B goes to infinity and we're doing this integral right here. So you're integrating What's the integral here? Ln of what? Ln of w, and you're integrating it from ln2 all the way to ln b of this thing right here. So, so what do you have to do here? So yeah, I mean you get it because when you plug these in, what this, what limit are we going to get? The limit as b goes to infinity of what? Ln of what? Ln b minus ln of ln of Two. Well, this is static, so you don't really care about it. But what happens to this? This is going to go to infinity. So this right here is going to go to. So what does this do? It diverges. So therefore, which is the answer? Because this is specifically asking which converge. Well, this diverges. So let's just say.
Does that kind of make sense? It's asking you, it gives you the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx to 6. What is the value of 1 to 4 of f of 5 minus x? You have to manipulate this so that you can then plug this in and get a number, right? So how do you do that? What do you do on this one? What I did is use yeah. the fundamental theorem. Yes, exactly. So what did you do? You took this right here, Ray? Yeah. f of 5 minus x dx, and what did you do? I wrote it as capital F. And I plugged in each. So f of what? One. Well, hold on. You, you wrote this as f of what? Five minus four. Well, five minus, hold on. Five minus x okay. minus uh, the integral from what to what? Sorry, excuse me. From uh, one to four. One to four. I just want to write it out like that, right? So what does that mean? This is equal to f of one. five minus four, right? Yeah. Minus f of five minus what? One. One. So this is equal to f of 1 minus what? f of 4. Is that correct? Oh, wait, that's fan that's interesting. But what is that right there? That is the opposite. That is the opposite of the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx. But we know that this right here is equal to what? It tells us it's equal to what? 6. So what is this whole thing equal? Negative six. Oh, is there? Oh, interesting. Hold on. Oh, so look, when you integrate, there's a, it's a negative x, right? So what should this be? Negative. This should be negative, right? Why? Because look, if you if you were to do this, ready? If you were to do this, if you were to differentiate this, right? It's going to be equal to f of five minus x times negative because you have to pop out the derivative of this x right there. Right, so if you integrate, you're gonna have to do the same thing. Like, what is this? The what is what? What function do you need to differentiate? So what's 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 on the outside of this whole thing? Negative. So what do we end up needing to do here? Negative. So what's the answer? Six. Does that make sense? Does everybody everybody follow that? So I guess one key to looking for to be a little wary is this is a 42 question. I will say that they will give you ones like this that are much more straightforward in the lower sections. I've seen ones just like this that don't involve a trick like this. But right here, this whole thing really comes down to that negative sign. Awesome. At least we found it. But again, don't forget the chain rule, I guess. Differentiation. What type of differentiation do you need to use to do this one? There's a really big hint in the answers. What do you have to use? Logarithmic differentiation. This is logarithmic differentiation. Are you ready? Remember, what's the mo can you just point to the totally wrong answer? A, and B. A is so wrong. Please, you can't just use the power rule on that, right? Because x is in the power and it's in the base. You really, really can't just use it. It is not A. And I like B because B is like, well, you're going to use it and do the chain rule. Like, just, 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 just don't do this. No. Incorrectly, right? <laughs> so please, those are like, take the wrong one. Don't. Don't. Okay, so the way you do this is you literally write it as, okay, ready? Here's the function you're trying to differentiate. Y is equal to x squared plus x to the x, right? So we're going to do a little bit of manipulation first before we take the derivative. And do you remember what you do at this point? What do you do? You take the ln. ln of both sides. So you have ln of y is equal to ln of this thing, right? Correct? But what's the nice thing you can do now? Ah, uh, yeah, I do ln y is equal to x ln of x squared plus 1, right? Now what do you do? What type of differentiation? Product. We're going to use the product rule, but we're doing what type of differentiation? Implicit. So what's the derivative of ln y? Uh, y prime, thank you. Right? Equals, and what do you have to do? The derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, which is going to be 1 over x squared plus 1 times what? 2x. 2x. And now you just have to clean this up, because what are you trying to isolate? Oh, uh, y prime, right? So clean it up first. You know, so you have ln of x squared plus 1. And what happens here? Where does the y go? Oh, I'm going to tell you in one second. So then what are you left with on the right? How do I cancel what? Is it, is just, it I'm not done yet. I'm not, not done yet. I'm just simplifying the right hand. I'm doing basic, basic. No, no, no. X and 2x. It's two x. <laughs> it's, is it 2x? Oh, thank you. You just got my, I'm awesome at algebra. Thank you. 
it doesn't actually do that. So I'm on the record as saying thank you. Thank you, kids. That's 2x squared <laughs> over what? <laughs> it's my subconscious going, make it cleaner. But so we know y prime is equal to this thing times what? But what is y equal to? This thing right there, right? So this is equal to, you know that this right here is equal to what? Plus 1 to the x. So we now know that y prime is equal to ln of x squared plus 1, right? Plus 2x squared over x squared plus 1 times what? Oh, look. Is that one literally right there in front of us? Yeah, it is. It's right there. There's Z. This is. Okay, kids. Basically, the only thing you need to remember is if you are asked to differentiate something with the x in the base and the power, logarithmic differentiation. Natural log is your best friend. There it is. So, yeah, partial flotation device. That would be no, personal flotation device. Personal flotation device, yeah. So this is, this is a PFD question. PFD. So when you're doing this, what's the first thing you need to do? You need to answer this question. 3 over x minus 1. And by the way, as far as I know, this is as complex as the PFD questions will get. I don't know if you remember, but sometimes you could raise the powers of these things, and it gets more annoying. <laughs> don't. What you're doing is you're taking this, and you're answering the question, this is equal to a over x minus 1 plus b over x plus 2. You break it up into 2, and then it becomes a pretty straightforward integration question. So how do you do this? Basically, do any trick you want. Multiply by the denominator, like common denominator. So you get 3 is equal to a times x plus 2 plus b times x minus 1. So you know that 3 is equal to uh, uh, a plus b times x plus 2a minus b, right? So what does that tell you? a plus b is equal to 0, and 2a minus b is equal to 3. So now is this just a simultaneous equation? This is where you hope you don't get some weird inconsistency, which is always kind of disappointing. Uh, so you end up with b is equal to 2a minus 3. Kick that back in there, and you end up with a plus 2a minus, can't write, 3 is equal to 0. So 3a is equal to? So a is equal to? B is equal to? I know. I'm going really fast. I will stop. What I did there is I just substituted okay, it and I got this. Being, oh, I knew this because A plus B is equal to zero. I'm just cruising through the algebra. So now you can kick this back up here. So you now know it's 1 over x minus 1 plus what? And B, negative 1 over. And now what are you doing? You're doing the integral of this from what to what? 2 to 3. This is where you just have to be super careful, because they're in your answers. Are they going to have every possible common mis like missed math piece? Yeah. Okay, so let's keep on going here. So we have this right here, right? Minus one over x plus two dx. So when you do this, you end up with what? When you integrate this, ln of x minus one minus ln of x plus two, and you're doing this from what to what? Two to three. 2 to 3, so you're going to have ln of 2 minus ln of 5, right? Minus ln of 1 minus ln of what? 4? So when you do this, you end up with ln of 2 fifths minus, what's ln of, what is this right here? Zero. That's 0, right? That's 0, so you end up with plus ln of what? Four, right? When you add natural, when you add logarithms, what do you do? So you end up with ln of what? Is that one of the answers? Yeah. And I think that is the answer. There it is. Is it oh, seriously right there? I just cranked that out basically as fast as I reasonably could in as in a efficient manner. I didn't make any sidetracks. I just crushed through that. It takes a little bit of work. That's specifically why they don't give you a nastier PFD to work with at the beginning, because this isn't really calculus. This is a mechanism you learn. Like in pre-calculus, in my prior in St. John's Academy, I would, we would teach PFDs and specifically say, it's kind of cool, but you're really only going to use it in specific situations in a class. Hopefully many of you take it, but not this year. You know? So this is a mechanism that you usually learn somewhere else. But anyway, this is as clean as I can make it right there. I will say what's kind of nice is you can be kind of sloppy here and use logic a lot of the times. There's certain magic values that work. You see how we got to here? You see this right here? Sometimes you'll get something where 
keep in mind, this has to be true for all values of x. So you can choose any value of x you want to find out what a and b are. So this is one method, getting a simultaneous equation like this. Another method is to say, OK, what happens if x is negative 2? Well, a goes away, right? If a goes away, watch this. So if x is negative 2, this goes away. And it's plus b times x minus 1, right? Correct? But it's negative 2. What's negative 2 minus 1? So what do you get? 3 is equal to negative 3b. So what does b equal? Negative 1. Put x is equal to 1 right here. 0. Being becomes 0. What's 1? Oh, 1 equals 3. It's negative 1. Keep in mind, there is, a, there is a logical inconsistency, which is the following. And I think we talked about this a little bit months ago. Yeah. Can you plug in 1 or negative 2 into the original function? Like, it's not part of the domain, right? Yeah. Ooh, just forget about it. Just do it anyway. It seems to still work. We don't care. OK. <laughs> Pick another one. We'll do one more. This is pretty cool. And if you're integrating from like a to b here, if you do this integral, but you take out, if you take out, so let's say a is, I don't know, let's say 6 to 8, not to scale, right? If you were to say instead, let's put a 7 in here. If you were to integrate from 6 to 7 and then add from 7 to 8, you get the same thing. Remember how you can add blue yes. integrals together? But if you delete, if you were to do the integral where you got infinitely close to 7 and then skipped over 7 and got infinitely close to 7 on the other side, it doesn't actually change the overall value of the integral. What I'm saying is you can take out infin you can take out an uh, as long as you take out a finite number of cuts like that, it doesn't actually change the overall value of the integral. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's you're cheating a little bit because it's not cheating. The logic behind it is you're taking out slices that have no width. Oh. If you have no width, you have no area, right? So therefore it doesn't change the area, but it's kind of cool like you can cut it without actually changing anything. Okay, so this is what I'd like an integral here. So let's say we did this. Here's your function f of x, right? So let's say you're going from, I'm going to do this as general as I can. Let's say you're going from 0 to, let's say, a, okay? The general form of that integral, usually you would write the integral from 0 to a of f of x dx, right? Correct? The Riemann sum, the way you would construct a Riemann sum is you're constructing what shapes are you building? You're building lots and lots of what? You're building lots and lots of rectangles, right? Can you stop just playing with? Oh, you got it. Okay. You're building lots of rectangles, correct? Yes. What's the distance from 0 to a? Well, that's a minus 0, right? What's the width of each of these pieces going to be? Like this width right there, that width right there is going to be a minus 0 over n, correct? So if you go from 0 to 1, it's 1 over n, and then 2 over n, then 3 over n, and then 4 over n, right? The width of each of these pieces is going to be a over n. When you're looking at this question, where was it, number what, 40 what? 45. Let me just see for one sec. I just don't have it pulled up here. 45, it says to you specifically on 45, it gives you this. It gives you the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n uh, times 1 over n squared plus 2 over n squared plus dot, 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 3n over n squared, like this. This right here is the base of each of your the base of each of your rect the base of each of your uh, rectangles. It's the base of so wh what does that represent in this integral? Matt said it already. Like the dn, the base. So when you're adding up all when you when you write the equation, I'm doing a little worse at this than I hoped. This rectangle right here, what's the what's the width? What do we call that? We call that usually like dx. Delta. It's the delta x. It's the delta x. So when you're looking at this right here, this right here, you can think of as the the dx, right? And then each of these, this is the height of the first rectangle, and this is the height of the, so this is height 1, this is height 2, and this is the last height, right? And this is the one you really want to focus on to begin with because n is going to what? n is going to infinity. So what is this going to? Well, no, no, the inside thing. The squaring is the function. 3 over n over n is going to 3. This is going to 3 squared, right? So the last height, you're plugging in 3 to get the last height. So what do you know now? You know now you're going from an integral that's ending at 3, correct? This is the first one you're plugging in. Right? Right. Right. As n goes to hits, as n is really, really big, 1 over n is close to what? It's infinitely close to 0, right? So what's the, what's the lower limit of integration? Zero. Zero. And then what function is acting upon each of these right here? Square. It's squaring. 
This right here is the exact same thing. This is the expanded Riemann sum expression for this integral. Here's the basic thing that you see. The most general form I can possibly make this, Tori, the most general form I could possibly make this would be if you went from a to b of f of x dx, the width of each piece, the dx, the width of each piece is going to be b minus a over n. Because you're going from you're going from a to b, right? So what's the distance from a to b? b minus a. And you're dividing it into n pieces, right? And then the height of the first one is going to be, you plug in a value that is one segment over from the starting value. What's the starting value? A. So it's actually A plus B, the, what's that width? B minus A over N. This is the first X value for the height. So when you're over here, look, what did we start at? It started at zero, right? And we moved over the width. But do we have to start at zero? We could have started at... 7, right? And then it would be 7 plus this, and then 7 plus 2 of them, and then 7 plus 3 of them, right? So in this super general case over here, Tori, right here, this is the first one because it's the there's only one segment needed. You say uh, plus bi, sorry, like this, times 1. What would be the next one, though? And then you have to, sorry, to be even more specific, this is the height, right? So what do you have to, where do you have to plug this in? That's an x value. If you want to get a height, where do you have to plug it in? The function itself. So in this expansion right here, what is the function? The square root. You see the function right there? So in the super general sense, what would the next term be? It would be the function, right? a plus b minus a over n times what? 2. Because it's the second one. Go back to this picture right here. How do you get the height? So this is the this is the so if you wanted the first rectangle on this, where's the first rectangle? The first rectangle is right here. Do you see this one right here? How do you get the height of the first rectangle? You plug in this x value, right? right. This x value is zero plus one width. How do you get the height of the second one? Zero plus two widths. Zero plus three. Do you have to start at zero? Okay. No. So the super general version of this looks like this right here. You have this right here is, what does this represent? That's just the base of each rectangle. This right here is the height of the first, the height of the second, and so forth. The height of the third, the height of the fourth, the height of the n. What they expect you to recognize when you see this is base, heights, 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 heights. What's it starting? Oh, it's starting it's zero. Because is there anything being added to this one over n? No, there's no zero. Is basically, is there an invisible zero plus this, zero plus this, zero plus this? Sure. Zero is invisible, you don't have to write it out. It goes from zero to three, which is x squared, which is basically what it is. This is a test to see if you understand the deeper, not like to a certain regular depth of Riemann sums. Because usually you get to the habit of seeing Riemann sums just in the summation format, right? What you generally see is, you know, summation of any, you know, you know, i equals 1 to infinity, and then the i, the, the, that index variable goes up. Like in this expansion right here, where's the index variable? Right here. That's your i value. You know, i goes from 1 to infinity as n goes from 1 to infinity. Anyway, you need to recognize it. Great observation, Ty. The 1 should be a, should be a 3, right? It should be a 3. So when you make it, when you make it a one, what does that do to the overall value? Oh, three one third of it. Does it make it? Did the, so when you make it one instead of three? Hmm. Does it have a one? Doesn't have a choice of one. So I'll try to record a better ending to this, but just be careful on this. This is not as straightforward as we thought it was. More later.